Today, I'm chatting with the fascinating Mark Shaler about all things sustainability. And Mark really knows his stuff. He's the author of You Can't Make Money from a Dead Planet. He consults with big businesses and small businesses to help them do better when it comes to their environmental footprint. And he is one of the co-founders of Reasons to be Cheerful, a platform for spreading good cheer and hope in a world that can sometimes feel bereft of both. In this episode, we discuss the environmental cost per wear of a garment, why wool is such a great fibre, recycled polyester versus cotton, which is better, and the answer may surprise you, and what other fibres we could be growing in the UK to be more regenerative. So I hope you enjoy this interview with Mark Shaler. It's a good one. Here you go. So hello, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me on the Make It British podcast today. And it's a joy. G- genuinely, it's a joy. Uh, well, I, I, after I started reading your book, I thought I've got to get you uh, on the show. You can't make money from a dead planet. The sustainable method for driving profits. What an amazing title. Amazing. You... Yeah, thank you. It's interesting that the, the subtitle I'm getting a bit of pushback on, right? So the main title I really love, I didn't write the subtitle, um, but there, there, there's an element of the, the audience that read that as business as usual, when, it, when it obviously it isn't, it isn't that. But yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually contemplating on the second edition, we, we tweak it a little bit. And uh, I, I also want consumers, horrible word, citizens, normal people, pick this book up because the first half of it is about is about how we got here the first half of it is not about business at all it's about society and uh, and i think that's you don't pick that up often from from the book yeah and there's some amazing like facts and figures in here you've obviously really done your research you really know your stuff where did it all start how did you even get into sustainability i love this story i, I love this story i really do katie so I, uh, I'm old, I'm 55, and I went to school um, in the 70s and 80s. And um, I, was, I was really enjoying all of the subjects. I loved, I loved literature and I loved art. I was rubbish at drawing, but I loved art. I lo- absolutely adore humanities. Geography in particular is just really powerful. And, but I'm a scientist, so I love physics, chemistry. And I wanted to choose options that didn't work together. So I wanted to do English. I wanted to do um, a physics uh, and I wanted to do geography. And I didn't, they didn't timetable well. And so I couldn't, I had, to, I had to mess around and miss bits and all that stuff. So I did a psychology A-level at the same time, which I really, I did that out in the even, evening school, um, which I really liked. And having that, having that um, really big wide breadth of, of, of subjects kept me hungry. I loved that we narrowed too, too early. Uh, so when, we were, when I was about to go to university, I was trying to work out what to do. And I'd got in my head that I wanted to be a social rights lawyer. So I applied to do law in Bristol, I think, or one of the Southern cities. And thank God, I failed. I failed literally everything. I passed geography, failed everything, and had that like road to Damascus. Oh, I, I've, I've been having too much fun with my mates. Too much going out drinking, too much good time with my girlfriend. I need, this This needs to change and I need to buckle down and do the work. So I did, I buckled down, I did the work and it allowed me to have a rethink of where I was going. And I then found a course in Bradford Uni called Environmental Science and Geography. So I could get a little bit of humanity in with my science. And a friend of mine was there and I liked the sound of the course and I liked the sound of the city. And I just went, yeah, that'll do. And also it was the only university that wasn't shared between me and my girlfriend at the time. And I thought I probably need this just in case. And so it became this kind of place to go that, that, I, that aligned all of my loves and interests. I had a friend there already and, um, and, it, and it allowed me to kind of have some individual space too. And that's what I did. And so I did environmental science and geography. Uh, and I loved it. And I was the probably one of the only one out of 56 on my year. There may be three of us that went into sustainability. Others went into teaching or planning or, or something that was kind of allied to geography. Whereas I thought, no, no, I want to do this. And I was really lucky, Kate. My, my big breakthrough, really, well, I had two big breakthroughs. But the first one was on my placement year. I, um, I applied to do all of these amazing placements. 
some of which were in like, outward bound centers. And there's a tendency to look at that. And, and, and but the one I really wanted was in Camden. Uh, and I was, cause that was, it was a really cool place to yeah. be. And this was 1990. And I thought, well, oh, pre Brit pop. So the good mixer was still a pub where, where, you, where you didn't go. Um, and I thought, now I want to be there. Um, and I applied for this amazing job with the transport and environmental consultant. I didn't get an interview. And I was, I was heartbroken. But the two people that did get an interview were brilliant, but I couldn't work out why I was less brilliant. And sometimes you just need somebody on your side. And one, and the placement secretary was an, ama an amazing woman called Sue Norman. And Sue came and found me. She actually pulled me out of a lecture and said, you've not been selected for interview. I think it's a travesty. I think you're the right person for this job. I'm going to call them. Oh, wow. I said, oh, okay, thank you. So off she went and called them. And then she came and found me a couple of hours later and said, you've got an interview. It's Thursday at whatever, 10.30. And, um, and off I went, slept in, actually nearly missed my train, got the train down there, had this interview. And it was just, it was just a, a clearly, you know, a stick or brick moment where I fitted them like they fitted me. And, um, and I got the job and I, and off I went to, to spend the year working with this amazing man called John Roberts, a Dr. John Roberts, who he died the year after I was there actually. Um, and I got two things from him. No more than that. I got this understanding of space design and behavior, how one can influence the other. If you want to create static spaces for retail, you can do that. And we, I was working in Clarkenwell on Clarkenwell Green. We were redesigning the streets. Clarkenwell was a very dynamic place that you yes. drove through. You didn't go and stay there. It wasn't space. And, and none of the roads were built to, to, to make you want to loiter in a, in a good way. Not in a, it was near King's Cross. You don't yeah. want to loiter too much around there at that point. Um, and so we were changing space. We were looking at the, the Dutch traffic calming and space making, town making. We were applying some of that to, to, to Clarkenwell. And, and that just like filled me with absolute love for the way that design can change behavior, the environmental determinism. And the second thing he taught me was the power of a small business with a mighty leader. And, and it didn't matter that we were on the top floor flat or top floor house in um, a room in the house of a, on a top floor in Arlington Road in Camden. We were writing policy. We had John, John Prescott was the deputy transport minister at the time. So I would be letting him in the door like every three days because he'd be coming in and getting a brief in. So you've got these really small, amazing minds that can still have this global impact. And, and, I, and I realized that actually you don't need to go and work for someone huge. And the big companies are fine over there. If all of those people are fine. But actually you can be really small and you can be really mighty. So I did that. We finished my, got married, got married in my place one year, which is very unusual. Um, and then, um, and then finished my degree and had a second break, which was working with the small business community in, in Yorkshire but, and paid for by the local authority to go and do free environmental audits on these amazing small businesses. So we went from, you know, the textile industry, which was in, in, in yeah. serial decline in, in Bradford at the time. Printed a packaging industry, which was doubly important. It was, there were more, you know, 16% of industry in the, in the city was printed and packaging compared to a national average of ever eight. And these really small retailers and incredible makers of clothing. So I, I spent my, you know, the next six years going in and out of little businesses, just trying to help them. And we, yeah, we were saving the money through sustainability. That's a definite thing that you do. But actually I ended up being really good at helping them understand their purpose, their why, their, their brand, and helping them articulate this in a way that felt less forced. And so we grew that. We grew that, that activity. And we had, we had thousands of members of the club in the end. Um, and then I got headhunter, headhunter, asked to go and be head of sustainability at ASDA. And, wow. and I'm not knocking ASDA. They're, 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 a, they're a fine organization as far as big, big supermarkets go. But back then, they'd just been bought by Walmart. And, and you couldn't have gone from one extreme to another. It was just small businesses in Bradford, massive corporate American supermarket. And I absolutely hated it. Yeah. And nothing to do with the people, well, apart from my boss, who was dreadful. Um, nothing to do with the people. It was to do with the way that they saw the world. And I, I saw a fairer, smaller, kinder world. And, and th at that point, they didn't. It's a changed business now. That whole market's changing. So I did that for a bit, hated it, and then left and set up my own business in, 20, in 2001. And that was a small consultancy. And we grew it and grew it and grew it and grew it. And 20, 
two years later, I'm still, I'm still doing it. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a scientist with a bent for human interaction. And, um, and I love the way the business is uh, the enterprise, although it's created most of the world's problems. I think it's the only thing that can fix them. I truly believe in the regenerative and purposeful power of enterprise. That's amazing. There's quite a few parallels there that made me chuckle with, with, with my kind of background. You're obviously a similar, very similar age to me. I had the same issue where physics and needlework, as it was called, needlework O-level, clashed on the curriculum. And my dad said, oh, you're a clever girl. You must do physics. So he said, if you pass your physics O-level, I will let you do needlework for A-level. And of course, the rest is history in terms of that. But I then also... That. I love that. I was in Camden in 1991 because I set up one of the first recycled clothing brands called Cat Weasel, and we had a stall on Camden Market in 91. I remember. I thought you I might. Yeah. Yes. Oh, because at, at, at that point, Camden Market was only open on Saturday and Sunday. Yes. It was, it was, it was really lovely. And I bought, I mean, I bought, I've got this, t I haven't got it with me, sadly. So I was, I ended up being friends with, um, I'm an amazing artist called Jessica Albarn, who happens to be Damon Albarn's sister. So I, the first, my first week in London, I went to see Blur. They just changed their name from Seymour to Blur. I went to see them. And Damon was wearing this amazing t-shirt with penguin books and screen printed of the thin man. And it was completely illegal. It's not nothing to do with penguin. And I went to the market store on the weekend after and bought, and bought one. Um, what did I buy? I can't remember what. It wasn't Brighton Rock. It was, um. Jack Kurak on the road in, in, in Orange. I've still got it. So it's 33 years old, that T-shirt. It's so well made. So I knew all of the stores. I knew Cat Weasel. Yeah. We that were up is. on the stables bit and we used to get there every Sunday. Yeah. You had to get there about five in the morning to get your pitch. It cost 25 quid for the pitch. You had to scrape the ice off the metal table before you set up because it was freezing and stand on cardboard. And we used to make clothing out of um, disused blankets and, and Joe that I did the business with sometimes would screen print on top of them. Um, probably made more money back then doing that stall than we ever have. And we had some like amazing people like Brad Pitt and wearing Kate Moss wearing our stuff. But anyway, that's an aside. We're here to talk about you, but it just obviously we're of a similar yeah, but age. It isn't, but, it, but, it, but it isn't an aside. I'll tell you what, all of the conditions that made your business and, and the affordability of what you did flourish, all of those conditions have gone. Right, so the enterprise allowance scheme or any of the support schemes that were there yeah. for small entrepreneurs and comedians and bands, all, bit, all been removed. The, the, being able to pay £25 for a stall on Camden Market, been, been, been removed. Being able to make clothes really cheaply, really easily, we've lost those skills, been removed. We have removed all of the building blocks that allow small entrepreneurs to flourish. Red or dead would not exist if it had to start today because they couldn't have done what they did. It's, it's not on a side. This cuts to the, to the nub of how we create a, a more generative, fairer, leveled up economy that allows people with ideas and not privilege to, to, to thrive. And, yeah. um, and, and I'm sad for those days. Yeah, I am too. It's, yeah, like you say, it's so, so much tougher now. For, especially, you know, I did study design. You cut, but the students coming out of college now, they've only been taught to design. They don't necessarily know how to make things, which is shocking. Um, like we've said earlier, artificial intelligence is going to take over a lot of jobs, maybe even design jobs, but it won't take over actually making things with your hands. You yeah, know, we need exactly. to we need to bring more of that back. So one of your kind of your tagline for uh, for This Is Ape is we help big companies think small and small companies think big. Absolutely love that. So um, yeah, it, tell me more about that. So it, it, it came from some work I was doing with a very large company. I mean, some of my clients aren't, you wouldn't naturally like them and you wouldn't naturally think that I would work with them. I, I appreciate that. However... I only do work that is purposeful. Um, I actually have done one contract that wasn't, it was just a new drink thing. But most of them, it, it, I only do purposeful driven work. And, and you'll never hear about it with those big companies because it will go through 20 iterations and pop out in five years time. And my name won't be associated with it anymore, but, but that's what I, what, what I do. And in all of that work, the thing that came through was their inability, those large organizations' inability 
to see trends. They, they know data. Like data is really interesting, but it's already it's the past, right? I can tell you the most commonly eaten lunch in Copenhagen yesterday. Instagram will tell me that. TikTok will tell me that. And it'll, it, for certain, it would have been avocado on toast with some chili flakes and volcanic salt, right? Well, that's what it would have been yesterday. That's amazing. But... That doesn't tell me what the most, the most commonly eaten lunch in Copenhagen in five years will be. And if I'm opening up a shop in Copenhagen, a restaurant, a cafe in Copenhagen today, I don't want to work on data. I want to work on insight. And, and we know what that, we know what it will be, Katie. It's going to be probably lion's mane mushrooms on toast, on a sprouted toast with a kombucha on the side. We know this, right? I do so love a bit of lion's I, mane. I was really, a, oh God, it's the best. Like fried like a steak. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Um, but the interesting thing is those large companies with all that money and all of that power were missing the nuances of enterprise. And so I used to go and do the tangential work. So if I'm working on a, I don't know, a new food brand or some, some trends over there, I'd go and spend my time in a coffee shop. What, what coffees are we drinking? Oh, we're drinking natural coffees. So they're not overly roasted. They've got a fermentation tone because you keep the bean in the cherry for longer. So it tastes a little bit um, almost, I wouldn't say acidic, definitely sourdoughy, which means when you put milk in it, it can taste a little curdled. So people are moving away from milk, not because they're vegan, but because it doesn't taste right in those coffees. Milk is lactose, lactose is sugar. So there's a preference for less sweet over here because of the coffees we're drinking. And then you go and eat a normal piece of food over here with lots of sugar in and it feels alien. So we need to be aware of what's happening over here to understand what's, where, where the future is over here. And those large companies that missed all that. So I used to work with them to find tangential insights and to kind of dig into places that they would normally walk past. And loads of examples of that, which I won't go into now. So that's how helping big companies think small that's about staying ahead of, of, of their bigger competition. That's important. But let's be honest, the most important thing that I do is to help small companies think big. And that's around confidence, around um, marketing story. And, the, and marketing is a really interesting. I mean, I did a, in the book, I think I say it all the way through, my, my, my one lesson for marketing is stop lying, right? You've got to stop lying. It's as simple as um but when marketing's done well, when marketing finds a story and a purpose, it can elevate a brand without fibbing. And, and that, that's, the, that's like the, the gluey bit. That's the Velcro that attracts us to a, to a company that we really want to do well. And, and you see it with brands like Lucy and Yak, which are now huge. Yeah. Everyone wanted them to do well. Or Popham's, the bakery. Everybody wanted them to do well. So you get behind them. Places, whiskers, the bus, exactly the same thing. People get behind it and they want to, they want to, 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 to lift it. A home slice, if you're into pizzas, all, all those brands um, have so much love that they are able to think bigger because they're lifted above the horizon by their customers. Mm. That's, that's a gift, right? And, and so that's what I help small companies do. And actually, sometimes I just stand there going, go on, you've got it. Or sometimes you just need a cheerleader, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is so true. So like for small brands, you've got to get your why. It can't be about, oh, I'm just going to make pretty products anymore. Not at all. Um, or just, you can't just say, I am a sustainable brand. You've got to back it up. Which kind of brings me on to the topic of greenwashing then. Um, because it's rife these days, isn't it? Absolutely rife. What can small businesses yeah. do to avoid even accidentally greenwashing? Okay. So, and it is, it can be accidentally, right? We all, we, we all, we all want to do the right thing. And sometimes in rushing to do the right thing, we do exactly the wrong thing. Um, and that's really complex and science driven. And, and an example of that would be you know, rushing to put your peanut butter in a glass jar rather than using a, um, a PET jar, plas a plastic jar. That's exactly the wrong thing to do from a carbon perspective, but it feels right from oh, a consumer it? perspective. Yeah, it's exactly the wrong thing. It's so heavy. This carbon impact will be significantly, maybe two or three times higher than putting it in plastic, but we don't like plastic. And I, and I understand that. And it gets in the wrong places, but it gets in the wrong places, not here. It gets in the wrong places um, in, in other in other countries, and, and that's a systemic failure which we have to deal with because no one wants to see that at all. 
Um, so the science and the heart can sometimes com conflict, right? So we want to, to look like, we want to, number one, we do care. Right? Small businesses care more for certain. Number two, we want to tell our customers that we care because, because they care. 65% of consumers now classify themselves as purpose driven. 67% of employees classify themselves as purpose driven. So to, to signal that we can, we're doing the right thing is really important morally. And it's really important from a business perspective. So we tend to oversimplify. We use totems and we will get behind words like net zero or carbon neutral. And we will say, oh, we're a carbon neutral retailer. Actually, you need to qualify that now. So mm. the ASA, the Advertising Standards Authority, are all over this at the moment. You need science-based targets, qualification, and real clarity. But that's easy if you've got a team of environmental auditors working inside your organization. If you're a sole trader, yeah. I've just been down to Victoria Park um, Village this morning, and, and there's some amazing little small trade, small traders. I love it. It's a really vibrant, wonderful little community. They don't have the, the, the resources. So there's a, there's a chance that they will make claims that aren't necessarily founded in yeah. science. So you just need to dial back a little bit. Um, so that's when a small trader wants to tell an environmental story, tell it from the heart, but use numbers. So that, and there's loads of free calculators that you can use online to, to work out your carbon, your carbon footprint. That's the thing that worries me the least. The thing that worries me the most is when a large organization makes, makes huge swinging claims about what they're doing on sustainability and they nudge well into, um, into greenwashing and greenwashing becomes green cocking. Look at us, how great we are. This is portmanteau of, of peacocking and greenwashing that my friend Claire Kate came up with. Um, but we're seeing another reaction to this now. We're seeing so much cynicism. And, and people not believing it, that we're seeing green hushing. So people, so companies are doing great things, and then they're not saying anything about it because they're worried about someone throwing uh, criticism at them or the ASA seeing it and going, yeah, but. Um, and this is really dangerous because we, we should celebrate the things that we're doing, but we need to do so in a tempered way. So it's really challenging. You can't go out there going, yo, I am all for sustainability. We don't use secondary packaging great that's brilliant um so we don't use secondary packaging and what we've done instead is you know t tell us what you've replaced it with tell us the story and we'll love you for longer um and and i think that's that's the risk so so greenwashing became endemic no one believed anything and that's where we are now anyone says anything about what they're doing from a sustainability perspective and we all go yeah but really um mm -hmm. and that's really damaging to the movement because we risk friendly fire and we risk, we risk this disassociation and we don't have time. We, we know climate change is real and it's galloping. And when we hit, we're, get, we're not going to hit 1.5 degrees. We're going to probably go above two degrees. And, and at that point, we get these um, dreadful feedback loops set up where one collapse will accelerate another. When the warm ocean currents begin to divert and we get greater melting of permafrost, then we release methane from, from the stored permafrost. The methane is active for a very short period, but it's active in a really big way when it comes to climate change. So we don't truly understand the way these things intermesh with one another. So we have to stay below two, two degrees. Um, and, and the good news is everyone's doing something. The bad news is it's really hard to talk about without without greenwashing or, or, or green cocking and therefore people aren't. And that's a real worry for me. Yeah. So which are some of your favorite brands that you think are doing as the right thing? And is that really tough to say? Is that like choosing your favorite child? Yeah, it's, it's no, it's not, it's, it's tough, but not for that reason. My job is to celebrate everything everybody does we can't all be finisterre or patagonia we we just we just can't we can't all get to that level and one of the things i try and explain in the book is you can be low on circular economy but really high on supply chain relationships and that's okay 
it's, it's okay. As long as you're, there's a little, I put a little wheel in there and you, the bigger yeah. the area under the kind of spider diagram, the better. And as long as the area is increasing, it doesn't matter if you're a bit tardy on one that you, we've got to start somewhere. But there are some really obvious brands and I've named two of them already that are doing incredible things. But do you know what? I, I, I like my local cafe. I like, I like Popham's because they said, can you have that in a, in a ceramic cup rather than a paper cup? And, and I was only an espresso, so I don't need it in a paper cup. I'm going to drink it in about three seconds. <laughs> and, and so I, I would celebrate those small businesses doing small things every single day, every, in every street, in every city, more than I would celebrate amazing big businesses. And some of the big businesses are doing incredible things, you know, whether you're in Marks and Spencer's or Patagonia or whether you're at Vivo Bertha with, with their Revivo thing, there are hundreds of amazing examples. You don't need me to tell you who they are, um, but they're, and they're, they're all doing really good things. In fact, I wrote a chapter in the book, which was, because the book was 60,000 words, the target. I, I misread it as, as 80,000. So I wrote 80,000 words. So we had to remove 20,000 words. And, um, and I was faced with this. I remember the, the editor, a guy called Chris, a lovely man, messaged me and said, yeah, it's, it's good. It's very good. It's 20,000 words too long. Do you want to take a few thousand words out of each chapter? Or should we just remove one chapter? And, and I said, well, which one? And he said, the lessons from the best chapter is, I think, 17,500 words. So... So the lessons from the best, which is I go, I dig straight into what you just talked about, that had these amazing examples. And I took companies that you wouldn't necessarily align with good, and I talked about what they were doing. So I'm going to make it available, Katie, as a free download oh. on the associated website. Excellent. Um, because it's too good to not share. Um, but there are, there are many um, great businesses doing great things. And the main thing is I would rather have every, bi every business doing a little thing the one totemic business literally taking all the heat for saving the planet. And, and that's the truth. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, I've got to ask you about recycled polyester because it seems to be that every single brand now is using it. Give me your thoughts on that. Okay, it's written, these are really, these are uncomfortable conversations and we need to have them. When it comes to um, polyester, clearly it's a, it's a plastic. So it's, it's fossil fuel derived. We can, we can pretend it's, it's a byproduct. It, it was, and now it isn't. It's a main product. Its longevity can be amazing and can be short, depending on how it's made. Um, and it can be recycled probably. I mean, it's hard to say. It depends on the on the way that the polymers are made. But you could definitely recycle it as a fabric probably three times. As a, mo as a polymer, you could just chemical recycling in in infinitely. So that's interesting, okay? It isn't a natural material. It doesn't come from the back of a sheep when it isn't grown on, on, a, on a plant like cotton or, or wool is. However, when you wash it, it uses significantly less water and significantly less heat to wash and dry than a natural material. Wool is a bit different. Wool is magic. Mm. We'll come back to yeah. that in a minute. But versus cotton, on a life cycle impact, polyester wind. And that feels utterly wrong to, to, to say that. Yeah, I'm really The amount surprised. of chemicals in non-organic cotton is huge, right? It's a, it's that, there was a campaign that the, com the clothing company Howie's ran a few years ago, oh God, probably a decade or yeah. two ago, around organic denim. And, and they put a label in the back of their organic jeans and it said... Um, 100% cotton, 73% true. Um, cotton contains the following massive list of chemicals. Um, you sit in your jeans for eight hours a day and you know how nicotine patches work. Our cotton contains organic cotton, indigo dye. That's, that's it, I think, something like that. Um, and cotton it feels natural and is, unless it's organic, which is an expense and a privilege that we can't all, we don't all have. It's, it's a really damaging chemical. It's a really dam damaging product. Um, and, and then when we talk about polyester, we rush straight to this, um, the microplastics that are released during, during, during washing. And they, they are. There's no two ways about that. They're released and they're in everything, the seas the, and, and, and in our blood as well. But in deep ocean trenches, they're finding microplastics from polyester fibers that are maybe 20 years old. 
They're also finding microfibers from cotton that are 40, 50, and 60 years old. They're not breaking down either. Now, they're very different. One's inert and one is potentially not, not inert. But we have an issue with microfibers escaping the laundry process. And, and that needs sot solving pit period. When we look at the life cycle of a polyester garment, it, 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 it wins from a carbon perspective. And it beggars the question, is that the right metric? I'm not saying it is. Look, look at me. I'm wearing a co- an organic cotton so top. I. I've got a pair of all, I've got a pair of selvedge jeans with no elastane in them at all. I think I might have a stretchy tee on. Yeah, I've got a stretchy tee on, and I, and I think I've got stretchy pants on. Um, so so I, I tend to favour natural materials mm. from a wearability perspective, but from a long life perspective, um, polyester performs really well, and from a life cycle analysis perspective. It performs really well, and that feels uncomfortable. That feels like we shouldn't we shouldn't buy it, but in reality, it's not as bad. Now, I know there's a, there's a big proviso here, or, or a watch out. It's a watch out. the The fact that we can chemically recycle polyester almost ad infinitum is leading us, or leading some companies who are in the fast or faster fashion world to put all of their money behind polyester and say, consume all you want. It's not an issue. We're going to close the loop for you. You can crack on buying cheap shite forever. And in, in reality, that's not good for society. That's not good for the planet, no matter how closed loop that, that is. So my, my proviso is it's a really great material in the right place. And if it's, and if it's treated properly, but do you really need another T-shirt? That's fundamentally what I'm trying to say. When I go back to that guy on Camden Market who got into all kinds of trouble with Penguin Books, I think. Back I remember day, his story. Printing those. Um, yeah, it was brilliant. I yes. loved it. I, I wish I'd bought two tees, genuinely. Um, that's, that, that T-shirt is still there. It's a little bit stained and on the underarm. I've danced heavily through the rave era in that T-shirt. Um, but I don't know whether that would exist today if it was in polyester. Whereas I know it, it exists today because because it's in cotton, and I and I know that my stories, my war stories of wearing that t-shirt, that they're etched into it. And I don't think that would be the case for a polyester t-shirt. So it's yeah. a complex answer. Yeah. It's great. It's dreadful. The p the key thing is, did you need to buy it in the first place? Yeah. Which brings me on really nicely to the fantastic explanation you've got in the book about cost per. Sorry, but environmental cost per wear, particularly in relation to a pair of jeans. Do you want to just explain that to everyone listening? Because I think everyone needs to hear this. Yeah. So um, jeans are fascinating, right? They're, they're really, really. I'm going to give you a live example from yesterday, actually. That's how fresh and current I am, Katie. So um, jeans are expensive, right? They they If you buy a really good pair of jeans made in the UK or in Europe, you know, maybe you're buying a pair of nudies or you're buying a pair of Dawson or Black Horse Lane Atelier Mud High. There are many, many amazing jeans manufacturers. You're, you're going to be paying between 160 and 240, 240 pounds for a pair of you, which is, which is a lot of money, right? Now, all of those brands will guarantee those jeans for life. They will do free repairs for life. So those jeans, if they don't last you 15 to 20 years, there's a limit when you've got more repair cotton than you've got original cotton to hold it together. But if you don't get 20, if they're not 20 year, 20 year long jeans, then, then I want my money back, right? So that's really interesting. But at 200 pounds average, not many people can afford those. And so consequently, you, you can't afford those. So you go to buy a cheap pair of jeans and, and maybe you'll go online and buy a pair of jeans for, I don't know, 50 pounds. Maybe you've not got 50 pounds. So you go to um, a club book, as my nan used to call them, a catalogue, and you buy them there. And that comes with an in- comes with two extra costs for the poor. Number one, the £50 pair of jeans in those places is £89, not 50 because they're the market that can't afford 50 So you might as well fleece them at 89 because of what I'm going to say next. And then you tick the box that says pay weekly. And you can spell weekly in two ways. And so you tick that box and it's at 29 or 39% interest. Over four years, it's only four, five pound eighty two. I'm making all the numbers up um, per week, and then before you know it, they've worn out and they're not repaired free for life. 
they're worn out before you finish paying for them. And so when we look at the cost per wear of the more expensive jeans, they are significantly greater value. They're just a brilliant idea. The barrier is the business model. So if we can tweak the business model, and Mud are doing this in Holland, you can lease their jeans, which feels like you shouldn't do that because lease jeans, they're never yours. No, no they, they truly are. And your, and your stories are ingrained into, the, into, the, into the, the denim. If we can change the business model, we can allow customers to buy better and pay over time. And I'm not talking Klarna. I'm talking a longer time than that. Then the number one, the environmental cost per wear declines massively because the jeans last 10 years. Because if the environmental cost of a pair of jeans that last 10 years versus the environmental cost of a pair of jeans that last one year is the same. And you've elongated your, your impact. And number two, the price per wear becomes truly affordable. If we can democratize better, then we, then we win. And it's going to need massive business model shifts. It's going to need a different approach to banking, a different approach to the, 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 the kind of phasing of our income. And this is, this is the barrier to sustainability. It's finance. Yeah. It's never been technical. It's never been materials-based. It's about how we make more money from selling less but better stuff. Yeah, which I'm all about, of course, because if you buy something that's like, you know, you've just said quality pair of British made jeans, I'd say something similar if you bought like a Harris Tweed wool coat and it's been made. Yeah. People used to buy coats back in the day that would, you know, cost them a month's wages, but would last them 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, I've got lots of vintage coats from the 60s that are still going strong. Um, like you say, it is a re-education thing. The worst off, I think, are the youngsters that, you know, the gen, the gen Zs who don't have any dispo- enough disposable income. So they say, well, if I want to wear the latest thing, I've got to buy it from... Dare I don't even want to say the name of Shein, but you know. The names that we all know. The yeah, names absolutely. we all know. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So so you're suggesting that something like a, a rental model is the best way to go for that, for those yeah, people. Yeah, well, for some people, for some people, right? So that's what Mud have done. That, so they rent their jeans. Um, I, I, I would... I would want to own my jeans. I would, I, I would like to pass them down... Um, pass them down with to my kids right you know as, as as i age so i would rather than rental i would just say you know can i if i want to buy it over three years at a reasonable interest rate not at 39 percent at a reasonable interest rate so i would shift the model so that i'm i'm not leasing but i'm buying in chunks that would make the most sense to, to, to me in my life for others leasing will be the most cost cost effective but we have all we have all of the technology, we have all of the materials that we need to have less impact. The two things that need to change, one's mid business models, the way we make money. And the second is the reason that we buy in the first place. You know, shopping has become an antidepressant. Shopping has become something that you do to lift your mood or a leisure activity that you do with your your partner or your your parents or your friends, whatever it is. And that's 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 amazing. That's a really there are big psychological benefits to that. I completely appreciate that. But if we can do, we can buy less, last for longer, with less environmental impact and allow it to make, and allow it to make this more profit, which I think we can, then we're on to something. Then we can, we can change the planet without derailing the economy. And that's the fundamental challenge that, that we face. And to go into a local store and to have bought a product that has been reshored, you know, we've lost, you know, back to the to the the, the, the very title of your podcast and, and and what you do, Katie. We've lost key manufacturing skills into retirement forever. I grew up in Hinkley. It's it's home of the British hosiery industry. It is made Hinkley, socks yeah, for the army, right? And my mum worked in a socks in, in a sock factory, not on the factory floor. She was she very quickly adds. Um, she worked in as a receptionist in in that sock factory. Most of the town worked in hosiery in, in one way or another. Leicester was about a weaving and denim. Um, Nottingham was originally, interestingly, Nottingham, Nottingham made stocking, men's stockings. And the, the bottom literally fell out of the stockings market after trousers were introduced. 
No one wore stockings because they had full trousers. So Nottingham had to take what it had, which was this, this knowledge and this, and this ability to make stuff out of fabric. And that's how they discovered lace. So you would not have lace if the bottom hadn't fallen out of the trouser market. Re really interesting. And we've got all of these amazing skills and we are a, a threat of losing them. So, so Make It British isn't just about sustainability. It, it is. It's about having something to do in the future when AI runs our service economy for us. It's about being able to make something that is not necessarily cheap, but means so much that when you have it, you're really glad of, of, of having parted with that money to that person and had a nourishing and enriching conversation that's made you both wealthier one way or another. Oh, I love that. That's just brilliant. Exactly. And we, you know, we need those skills as well, not just to make new things, but to repair existing things. I think I've just read that France is, is now paying people to repair their clothing rather than throw it away. It's a shame we seem to be a bit behind on that sort of thing in this country. What are your thoughts on the whole repair model and where we're going on policy on that? Well, it's, it's, re it's really opposite and really well-timed. And I can go back to my jeans conversation. Um, so repairing is, is wonderful. We, there was a time, I, I mean, I'm old, I'm 55. When I was young, my nan taught me to knit. I, only, I could only knit a tie. And my dad, it was a green one. And my dad wore it as sympathy. Um, but um, I know how to knit badly, but I know how to take in trousers because a lot of trousers were quite wide and I wanted to go kind of like very kind of post-punk skag and narrow them. So I learned how to take trousers in. And then, of course, in the late 80s, when we went into flares, I learned how to put a V in them to make them really baggy <laughs> again. I, I learned some of those skills. They're rusty as you like, right? I bought a, I've got a really nice sweater. It's the sister one to this is yellow. And, and I, it arrived with a hole in it, but I, I, it may have been my fault. I can't remember. I think it's from a Kimball tag. So there's a little hole here. And over a first, it got, it got worse and worse. So I, I stitched a red heart over the, over the hole. Um, and I was wearing it on a call one day with a friend of mine. And he said, that's, that's brilliant. He's a fashion designer and he was really big in the 80s and 90s. 90s. And, um, and he said, let's, let's look at repair. So he's setting up um, a repair business. Oh, who's um, that? Called Heartfelt. It's a guy called Toby Clark. Oh, um, Toby. And, and his, yes. And his, I bet yeah. Toby. He, He'd be he, great for your yeah. pod, actually. Yes. He was involved in Black Horse so, Lane, so, wasn't he? Originally. He was. Yeah. Yes. And, he, and, he, and he was in the early days. He still is, I think, tangentially. So, so being able to apply the knowledge of a tailor to repair, that's amazing. I, I love this sweater. This is my favorite sweater. Um, it's colors me. It's absolutely wonderful. It will, it, my, my, my bristles will wear a hole here at some point and the cuffs will go. And I want to know how to fix that. I, I want to know how to, how to do that. And consequently, those skills, they're not skills of technical tailoring. They're skills that we've loved back into your, into your fabric. And, and that allows you to, to wear that. And you will literally wear your heart on your sleeve because you, you, you love this. And one of the things that Tobes do, he's a really interesting guy. He, he's developing um, clothing plasters that are really easy to apply. So, Genius. so you, you, you actually just stick them over. Oh, yeah, it's a really, really good idea. Um, and so I think repair. And if you go back to the conversation about jeans, every one of those brands that I talked about have a, have a repair uh, and refurbishment function track bags up in glasgow make bags for life they have a repair and a, and a refurbishment um service and and that's it's amazing old-fashioned uh, shoes you could yeah. send them back i bought a pair of churches this is my top my top you'll you'll know this but you won't know the story but you'll like this story um i bought a pair of churches brogues wide fitting because i like a wide fitting shoe off camden market for 30 quid this was about 20 years ago and they were great, but some of the broguing came on, some of the stitching that, that kind of held the shape together came undone. I thought, oh, I'm not in that. And even though I'd bought them second hand for 30 <laughs> quid. So I took them into churches on Regent Street and I went, this is, have you seen this? This is not good enough. And, and they were fantastic. This was pre-selling to Prague. This was when they were, they were owned by themselves. And they, um, they looked at it and they went, yeah, that's really bad. We'll, we'll get them repaired. We give us two minutes. And they started to fill in a returns form. And they, um, and they came out to me and they said, Mr. Latimer, 
And I obviously didn't look at them because that's not my name. And they said, Mr. Latimer, the Brogues. I went, oh, yeah, sorry. And they said, um, yeah, the, you had these shoes made in 1989. <laughs> that was the original owner. Amazing. Cause, cause, and they still had yeah, a record. Yeah, the code. To the, to the code in there. And Juliet did the same thing. And, the, and off they went and they came back and they're still working today. And that's, that's amazing. I didn't have to spend £400 on those shoes. I bought them secondhand for three hundred for £30. And the company have honoured that that repair that, that that level of skill is incredible and every time i put those shoes on i have a little thank you to mr latimer who originally paid for those shoes which i'm now benefiting from um and and i think there are some really great examples of how we can keep clothing alive for longer and that the challenge we face is shifting the the ego the the uh, our own brand projection away from having to have the newest to having something that lasts a long time. And that, you know, the best haircut is the one that suits you, not the one that's in fashion. And the best clothes are the one that suits you, not the ones that are in fashion. And the best clothes are often those that are bought in small scale from people who've made them with love and people who wish you well, rather than just want your next tail. Yeah, that's so true. Right, we said we would discuss wool. You mentioned it earlier. You studied in mm. Bradford as well. So if you studied in Bradford in the 80s, wow, the wool industry in there, then, even then, would have still been alive and kicking. Very much so, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I loved it, you know. Um, it, it's interesting. The sheep is an imported, it's a pest. The sheep is not an, uh, a UK native species. I think it comes from Iran, actually. And from a from an agricultural point of view, it's, there's a lot of destruction. It, it, it's part of deforestation. It eats small saplings for breakfast, li literally. Um, and so we need to manage our sheep numbers. That's I'm going to make that really clear up front before any regenerative agriculturists listen to your podcast and start sending me um, DMs or at me. Um, but that said, the clothes of the sheep grows for itself. Which, which we can then shear in a sometimes kind, sometimes unkind way, but they grow back. This is, this is a renewable resource. Wool is amazing. It, it wicks. It, it wears not brilliantly, but it can, be, it can be repaired. You can felt it to make a, a, a slightly different product. It's breathable, and, and we're really, really good at it. We've, we've moved away from organo, um, organo, organophosphate dipping in order to, to, to kind of cure the, the, the sheep of all kinds of things that weren't massively a problem. And that's really good for the, for the health of farmers and the health of sheep. And that means that when we get something out of wool, it's got less shit in it. Now, we, we strip the lanolin out, which is the natural oils of, of wool, um, um, and that's not a particularly nice process. And I've worked in the scouring industry, um, and I've seen what comes out of there, um, and it's, not, it's, it's, been, it's a messy business. It's a messy business. But it's a really clean product, and it's beautiful to wear. And, we, and we're now moving into a finer filament, the work that, um, I can't remember the, 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 the farmer's name. She's amazing. The work she's doing with the Beaumont Leslie. Fleets. Leslie. The Beaumont Leslie. sheep. It's Leslie, Leslie Beaumont, yeah. I think, isn't it? But Leslie Pryor. It probably is. You know, yeah. that would make a lot of sense, wouldn't it? Yeah. Leslie, anyway. that Or it's, uh, or, or it's Al Alice Marino. Um, no, it's Leslie Beaumont. You're right. So, so that, that whole kind of um, development allows us to wear wool more, more comfortably and breaks this myth of an itchy wear. And this is where we have to go. We, we have to go to a really good natural material where there's no, less shit in it that, that, that feels great on the skin and that performs really well. I've got some, this is going to sound awful. I've got some woolen underwear made with, with I think they're made from Bowman. They might be made from Merino, I forget. And it's the best underwear I have. It's breathable. It feels great around your yeah. jewels and 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 it, it's and it's grown rather than rather than made so i think wool is a really great option um and as you know from a carbon footprint perspective animals aren't brilliant but what but sheep are grazed naturally you know most of the world's soya i think something like 80 percent of the world's soya is grown to feed cattle not grown to feed vegetarians and vegans um whereas sheep graze and it's a it's a it's a it's a much more natural diet, and they're treated with fewer chemicals than other 
animals and 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 we eat we eat them and then and we can we can crop their their own clothes mm. so i think one is a really interesting one and having grown up not just lived in bradford and watched that wool textiles um kind of grow but also living in leicestershire where wool was also used massively in the hosiery industry um i can see a landscape shaped shaped by sheep and i can see a material that we We've, we turned our back on and we shouldn't. It's wonderful. Yeah, it's so true. We did turn our back on wool, which is a shame. I love, I'm a big fan of, of woolen things. Uh, there's also quite a few projects going on to revive the flax industry and hemp fibres and other fibres, natural fibres that we can use. Have you been involved in any of those? Um, you know what? Uh, back in the early days of my time working in Bradford, I worked with a guy called Jim Gilliland, and Jim set up a business called, and this is a genius name, called the British Empire. And Jim used um, hemp oils. This is not a druggy thing. Hemp oils to replace in soaps and, and shaving oil and stuff. I, I don't, I think he may have dallied in, in, um, in, in textiles, but he didn't go big into it. And I think there's a real opportunity here. When we look at hemp, jute, flax, but these are incredible materials that grow really well in the UK and they have numerous uses. Firstly, you can use them for, for biomass. Secondly, you can use them for rope. And thirdly, you can weave them and turn them into, into, into clothing. It all sounds a bit like Tom and Barbara in The Good Life with the famous green suit that, that, that he wore. But um, actually, they're a really great alternative to linens and to, and to, and to natural, na other natural fibres, but they're, they're grown here. And I think we have, um, it was two things here. We've ignored what's on our doorstep as a, as a raw material. And that's really sad. And number two, as soon as you begin to move into hemp as a conversation, then the UK government gets really nervous. The rest of the world is loosening rules on hemp growing and even, even the, the, the kind of other side of hemp that we all know about. Whereas the UK government is clamping down. Now that cannot be for any other reason than invested interests wanting it clamped down. And, and I don't even know how to have that conversation. In fact, I don't even know how to have any conversation with British government at the moment. Ah, you it's need to, I need to link, counter to, I need to link you up then with Tamara from Fashion Roundtable because there's a whole conversation that needs to be had that she's great at kind of getting in front of government and talking about policy and all things textiles. And yeah, I totally agree with I you would, with I this hemp thing. I've heard one of the reasons as well, it's difficult to grow hemp for textiles here is if you're a farmer with a hemp farm, you need massive security because some idiots break in and think they can smoke it. Whereas the type of hemp you grow for clothing usually doesn't have the psychoactive ingredient in it. But the teenagers don't know that. So they yeah. jump into the fields and start the, cutting it down. The, the, they don't know that. And when I was a student, people were buying budgie food called trill and growing it because it was hemp seed. And it's just hemp. It is, it is not cannabis sativa. It is not the thing that you, you then want to smoke. But, but we didn't, no one knew. I almost said we, and not me. No one knew. And consequently, everyone was growing this stuff and getting nothing from it. But if we need to deregulate that world totally. That, that whole world is, is, is open to, to, to revolution at the moment. And it's happening in America. It's not happening here. And that would then, I think, open the, open the door to saying, what an incredible crop. Let's grow this for other things. Let's focus on the other thing. Let's have the conversation that is adult and mature. And let's turn this material, which, which, which grows so well in Northern Europe, grows so well in the UK, turn this material into something that we can use, that is regenerative, that is renewable. It's an incredible way of knitting the soil back together. As a, as a, as a crop, as a plant, it's amazing. We need to fall back in love with it as a process yeah. and de destigmatize it. Yeah, There's so, there are so many small initiatives going on. And it goes back to what you said about, you know, small is, small is beautiful, as someone said when I was at the Houses of Parliament last week. It's, it was all coming back around. That book was written 50 years ago, and I'm sure you, you know yeah. the book. And it's, but now it really is. a it, it, Dumaca, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like now is actually the time to really say small is beautiful and Small businesses are amazing. And that's, you know, that's why I do what I do now. I, like you, you had your time at Asda. I had my time at M&S and Debenhams. And, and now I want to kind of put back and help those small businesses that are doing good things. And yeah, Mark, you're doing amazing stuff. Amazing. 
Um, before you go, just fill me in a bit. I know you run events as well. You've got your reason to be che- reasons to be cheerful event, which always does make I love. I follow the Instagram and it always does make me cheerful. Just look, just looking at the artwork for it. Um, tell everyone a bit oh, more about you. those events because I would try and like to try and get to one at some point, and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this come and speak. Oh, that come, I'd come be and speak delighted. At it next year, we'd, 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 we'd love we'd love to have it. it's a two day event next year. August bank holiday going to be right. Next year. I'll put it in um, the so diary. You've got to choose between. Between between Notting Hill Carnival or Reasons to Be Cheerful Live in Leicestershire, <laughs> it depends what kind of vibe you're after. Um, so Reasons to Be Cheerful started. It started at um, the Good Life Experience Festival in North Wales, where I was asked to host a day of diverse and inspiring talks, um, and we did that. And it, and it needed a sub brand, so I thought, right, Reasons to Be Cheerful. That's what this was 2019. So, so we did that, and I and I paid the um I paid the PRS license to use reasons to be cheerful by Ian Drury, and it was great. And we videoed them, and and they're all online somewhere. Um, roll on a few months, and we and we end up blundering into a um a pandemic, and um and I thought to myself, I'm I missed communion, I miss speaking to other people, so let's create a, a series of monday morning talks everything was we didn't we charged for nothing during the pandemic and we get two or three hundred people on guest speaker and we when we use the reason to be cheerful brand for that we then and my daughter my, my eldest daughter daisy and my middle daughter matilda but predominantly daisy runs runs that business and and then she said why don't we do a publication so we produced um, a, a couple of zines and then we produced an annual, which I wanted to do. Like, you know, when you were little and you had like the Beezer or the Wizard and Chips or you had the Jackie annual. And, and it was like, it was brilliant on Christmas Day to have, yeah. you knew you had two days worth of reading and activity. I wanted two days worth of reading and activity, but for everyone. And I wanted to spread some cheer at a time when it feels really hard to be happy or we feel guilty celebrating the small successes that, that, that we have. And I wanted to take cheer and make it an everyday experience rather than something that we get confused with elation. And actually, cheer is something different. And, and so we grew that over lockdown. We did loads of events. We had lockdown discos. We had the 1980s indie disco not many people like my music but then nick had a 1980s uh disco with like cheesy chit cheesy hit everyone loved that <laughs> so we did a few more of them and then we had them um, like live performances and all of that happened during lockdown and it was great and then when lockdown lifted we thought okay well, well but can we put everyone together but can we do it in a way that is inclusive so you'll go to some weekend events and they're like three or four thousand pounds for the weekend and that, that self-selects who, who can go so we did a one day event for under a hundred quid. We, we lost a bit of money on it, but it didn't matter for the first year. And we had the most incredible range of diverse voices that you may not hear anywhere else. Those, those voices then get used in those other events. And I, I know that that's part of, part of what we're really good at is finding talent. And it was such a nourishing day. We used local food people. We used diverse food people. And, and, and it was wonderful. We had a band in the evening. We had a disco in the evening. Um, it was year one. And we did year two this year. Um, and, and again, it, it sold out and we, we put the price up slightly and a few more people. Um, and that, that was really successful. And then the appetite was, and this is not us, this is the audience saying, this would be really great if we could just camp in this space and wake up and have a couple of talks in the morning before we head off. But we thought, well, well we can do that. We could do that. And, and we could have a bigger DJ set and we could have a slightly bigger band potentially. And so... Um, that's what we're doing next year. And I, it's, I do very little, Katie. My, my daughter, my, my daughters and my wife do that. And the volunteers and the speakers get paid. We, know, we, we pay everybody. And um, it's just the most wonderful celebration of community and optimism at a time when both feel under attack. Um, and, and I love it. And, um, and if it never makes any money, it, it kind of doesn't matter. It's just wonderful oh well i'd absolutely be delighted to come along next year so and that's great that you've got the whole family involved you've got quite a few children haven't you and chickens yeah it's not sustainable i can assure you now 
um, financially or environment, no, it's fine. It depends what kind of children you raise, right? I got four kids. So Nick and I, um, we got married when I was at university, as I said, and we had kids really early. We had kids when we were 25. Uh, I'm 55 now. So my eldest daughter's just about to turn 30 after, um, in April. And our youngest daughter's just about to turn 20 um, the next month in, in, in December. And, and, and I've got another daughter and a son in between. And every one of them, it works with us. And my son is a, an environmental scientist. He's got a first class degree in environmental science. He does all my carbon footprint in scope one, two, and three. Helps me with the strategy. Our oldest daughter has got a first class degree in art from Central St. Martins. She runs Reasons to be Cheerful and, and, and the production of those amazing. And they're beautiful. They are, thank you for that, Fever. They are beautiful publications. Um, our, our middle daughter, is kind of like the studio manager. She holds us all together and gives us some joy. And our youngest daughter is at university. Um, I'm, I'm not, she's not planning on working for it. It's quite amazing. I'm very proud of, of them all. They're, they're, they're way better than I am at everything. Oh, no, Mark, you don't put yourself down and say amazing, amazing book for anyone that, that uh, must, it's a must read, basically. Um, where else can people find you? If they want to get in touch with you. Where can they follow you? Oh, I'm so easy to find. I, I don't, I'm an introvert, you know, um, and people don't often believe that, but I tend to hide in the spotlight. I like the, I like the stage and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then I go and cry in my room on my own. Um, I'm on Instagram as um, at Mark Shayla. Um, I'm on, I think I don't do the Twitter one anymore because it's really not a nice place. Um, but I'm on, um, oh, what's the other one? Threads as at Mark Shayla. And, um, and you can find them. My, my website is markshayla.com or this is ape.co.uk. That one's being rewritten. Go to markshaver.com. The other one's being rewritten at the, at the moment. Um, and reasons to be cheerful.co.uk. Amazing. Mark, thank you so much for your time today. You're an absolute superstar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. You know, I, having, having watched, and, and it's, very, it's very hard to have these conversations without appearing quite Brexity. And, I'm, and that's the opposite of what I am. I believe in a broader bigger community rather than a narrower one same but here. having you know grown up in coventry and watched the car making industry decline grown up near coventry and then watch the hosiery industry decline and the textiles industry decline i i know that we can make amazing things in this country and i to, to reshore some of that it's not about jingoism it's about celebrating how good we were at these things and and how good we could be again yeah exactly Exactly. I had to leave Facebook because the Brexiteers like jumped on my Facebook page and were leaving some nasty racist comments and all sorts. And yeah, that's not, I'm exactly, I'm here for the skills and yeah, just everyone being able to make things again. So it's so important. Yeah. Brilliant. Mark, thank you Bless so you. much.